Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our third webinar from the East Sussex Eye Group. It's nice to have you with us again. Uh, as previously, this webinar will be recorded and will be available to watch on our YouTube channel, the East Sussex Eye Group. So for tonight, there is CET points available to, for today's lecture, which is available for optometrists and dispensing opticians if you're registered with the GOC. Um, I'll upload the CET points early next week so that you should get an email then. The lecture will run for approximately 45 minutes with about 15 minutes of questions at the end. So there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if during the webinar you have any questions, if you type your questions in the box and then at the end of the webinar, we'll, uh, we'll ask uh, Mr. Kashani to, uh, to go through as many as we can in the time scale. Can't guarantee to go through all of them, so apologies if I don't, but we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. So tonight I'd like to welcome uh, tonight's uh, speaker, Mr. Sharm Kashani. He's an ophthalmic consultant surgeon at East Sussex Healthcare Trust, specialising in, in high volume cataract and management of complex medical retina and uveitis disorders. His training centred around various prestigious London teaching hospitals, including advanced subspeciality training at Moorfields Hospital in medical retina and uveitis. He has previously been the clinical lead for East Sussex NHS Trust and is now the head of retinal services and uveitis. Tonight, he will present to us a webinar on the approach to understanding and managing of inflammatory eye disease. So I'd now like to hand over to Mr. Skashani. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. I'm going to share my screen with you. So hopefully that should uh, come up. Uh, let me just... Um get my right okay so hopefully you should get um, <clears throat> my screen now um, before the talk I did mention to Ian that I'm going to probably do this talk in two um, sessions so it, uveitis is not a, a subject that one can do in 45 minutes I'm sure you agree so this is literally going to be an approach on how you would manage a patient with uveitis and then my next talk would be about various cases and going through various histories and presenting case histories. So, um, so once again, thanks for Ian for organizing the webinar and thank you all for joining. So the aim of the lecture is to just go through the nomenclature. So, you know, what uveitis, various types of uveitis, pattern recognition. That's something that I'm going to talk about quite a lot with uveitis because that's very important when you come to think about various causes of uveitis and how to manage it and really what we often think about is when do you actually start treatment because often with inflammatory eye disease you think about uh, treatment options and what uh, things you need to do but sometimes you need to treat before you have investigations back so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Invest investigative modalities some things that you guys can do in clinic um, or in your um, outpatient setting, in your optometry setting, um, and various treatment strategies that are currently available. And I've added the last one because I think actually um, with COVID, there's some new regulation, uh, especially in patients with uveitis who are obviously at risk group with immunosuppressants. So classification of uveitis often is quite difficult, depending on what you read, the various ways of doing it. But in essence, people have usually used anatomical method as a way of um, classifying uveitis. I actually think that it's useful to use all three, which is to think about anatomical way of describing uveitis, etiological, and the type of inflammation that you have. And I'd like to share uh, that insight with you. So with respect to anatomical, you can have anterior uveitis. So that's the anterior part of the um, uveal system. So your iris, the um, kind of the anterior chamber, uh, which will form the anterior uveitis. Then you've got intermediate uveitis, and I'll come on to that um, in a second. Posterior uveitis, so that includes your po uh, focal choroiditis, choreoretinitis, retinochoroiditis, choroiditis and neuroretinitis and panuveitis. So anatomically, you've got anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis and panuveitis. When you look at different clinic letters that might have been sent to you or you're involved with, you might see any one of those um, 
names mentioned. So anterior uveitis, as the name suggests, primarily affects the anterior segment. So you would see the cells in the anterior chamber, you'd see iritis, and you might occasionally see, see a little bit of spillover in anterior vitreous. Uh, that's still anterior uveitis. So the, this is kind of the most common form of uveitis that you will see. Often without anything else, without anything in the back of the eye and um, without any other um, kind of reasons for it occurring. So it's literally inflammation in front of the eye. Um, it is very, very important that you dilate every patient with diagnosis of anterior uveitis and look at the back of the eye. Measure pressure and look at the back of the eye. Because unless you look at the vitreous and the disc, the retina, the blood vessels, you might miss posterior um, segment involvement. And that actually changes management and diagnosis massively. So in case of anterior uveitis, you're affecting the anterior segment, um, as I mentioned. And usually the HLA B27 syndrome center go with this. So patients with inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, who are HLA B27, uh, might present with anterior uveitis. Uh, patients with herpes simplex and zoster, um, and um, some of you might have seen the Fuchs heterochromic erythrocyclitis. So these are unilateral um, inflammations, often with iris heterochromia um, um, and cataract formation and raised pressure. And of course, post-operative. Um, some of you kind of feel that it's sometimes difficult to see cells. I always say, if you're trying to see cells, the best way to do it see a patient post-op um, like day one, then you'll easily see cells. And there's a way of doing that on the sit lamp, which I'm sure most of you know exactly how, how you do, but um, that's uh, kind of often a useful way if you haven't seen cells to, to look at that. Now, so moving down now to intermediate uveitis, a term that you may have also heard, and intermediate uveitis affects the middle portion of the globe. So that includes the vitreous, peripheral retina and the pars planar. So um, we talk about snow banking and snowball formation. I don't know if any, any of you have seen that. I'm sorry, in a Zoom meeting, it's very difficult to gauge um, kind of uh, the audience, but snowballs literally look like these white fluffs, uh, which settle down inferiorly. Snow banking is kind of uh, like a white, and there'll be pictures of that coming up, like a white sheet, um, again, in the peripheral retina. So uh, inter in intermediate uveitis, it doesn't involve kind of changes in the nerve or the macula um, uh, and other areas. This it mainly involves the vitreous, the very peripheral retina and the pars planar. Um, and it's often associated with granulomatous cause of uveitis such as TB, sarcoidosis and Lyme disease. So that's intermediate uveitis. Posterior uveitis, as the name may suggest, so I'm gonna get rid of this picture because I can't actually see my own thing. So posterior uveitis, as the name may suggest, um, involves inflammation of the choroid, the retina, and it also includes kind of, I've mentioned here retinochoroiditis or chorioretinitis, it doesn't really matter, it just depends where the inflammation starts. Does it start in the choroid, then go on to the retina or the retina and then goes into the choroid? You might have retinitis, which is essentially inflammation of the retina or neuroretinitis, uh, like cat scratch disease, where you've got um, optic disc swelling and exudation at the macula. And normally, condition infections tend to cause retinitis, such as toxoplasma or, or herpetic disease. And this is, this is why I say that you might miss posterior uveitis because somebody might come to you with reduced vision, floaters, um, you know, redness in the eye, anterior uveitis, and unless you look at the back of the eye, you might miss all this, and that's very important, especially in a patient with shingles, um, you know, they've got kind of a red eye and maybe few cells in the anterior chamber, you might miss retinal uh, necrosis in the back of the eye if you haven't dilated the patient. Choroiditis tends to obviously occur in the choroid, and you can get this with often infective and inflammatory conditions like TB and sarcoid. Multiple sclerosis actually is another cause of uh, choroiditis that, that we see. And an MRI scan is often uh, an investigation when you have a patient with choroiditis. And papillitis involves uh, a swollen 
uh, disc, uh, which if it goes long enough, will end up with a macular scar. And because of that, I've told plasmosis, viral retinitis and lymphoma. So posterior uveitis then involves the disc, the back of the eye, the posterior segment, basically the retina, the choroid, blood vessels, etc. Intermediate uveitis is different to posterior uveitis because it involves the middle portion of the eye. So we said the pars plana, the vitreous, and the peripheral retina, not the back of the eye. And sometimes you may have heard of pars planitis. Pars planitis is intermediate uveitis with, a, with an unknown cause. So again, getting used to the terminology. And pan uveitis is just a term where the inflammation is everywhere. So there's no pre predominant side, of, side for the inflammation, but you can see it in the anterior chamber, in the vitreous, in the retina, in the choroid. And, um, Often panuveitis is caused by infections like endophthalmitis, or you can get it in really nasty infections such as toxoplasmosis or inflammatory conditions such as sarcoid. So those are the four areas, anterior uveitis, front within of the eye, intermediate uveitis, just a bit behind, which is a pars planar peripheral retina and vitreous, posterior uveitis, which is the retinal choroid disc blood vessels, and then pan uveitis everywhere with nowhere that's kind of with nowhere in particular being predominant. So that was anatomical. And then you can think about etiology and etiology can be idiopathic. In fact, most of the times with uh, uveitis, we don't really know what the cause is. In particular, anterior uveitis most of the time is idiopathic. When you have posterior segment involvement, the risk of systemic uh, um, kind of condition being diagnosed then goes up. So often posterior segment involvement does make you think that something systemic might be going on. So that was idiopathic. You might get uveitis secondary to a systemic disorder. So often these patients may present uh, as the ophthalmic problem first. So you might have a sarcoid patient who will come with uveitis and then on direct questioning, you might find that they've had rashes or they get short of breath or they might have joint problems and then the investigation of sarcoid, or they may have sarcoid and they come with a presentation of the anterior uveitis. Um, again, uh, patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis often are diagnosed with that, with their GI problems, and then the eye comes on later. Um, and then musculoskeletal problems such as lupus and things like that, again, um, it might be that the eye is another site that's involved in the systemic condition. Infectious cause of uveitis, uh, so we think about viral. Herpes is the most obvious one. HIV, again, can give you um, uveitis. Parasitic, like toxo. Fungal, like candida. So these are kind of your other differentials. Uh, Lens-induced, this is these are hypermature um, lenses, uh, you know, cataracts that have gone on, and then the lens material basically um, seeps out of the capsule and causes inflammation. Traumatic is obvious, after surgery or after injury, you can get inflammation um, and toxic, like drug related or chemical injury. So that's just another way of classifying uveitis. So you can think of where it's occurring and then you can think, could, could this be secondary to a systemic condition? Could it be secondary to an infection? Could it be secondary to trauma? And that will really help you, knowing this will help you direct your questions. Something that I will mention again and again is about pattern recognition. So for example, somebody will come in with anterior uveitis and a bit of uh, vasculitis at the back, macular edema, and then they say to you that they've been short of breath and they've had a rash and you're kind of thinking towards sarcoid. So those are the kind of things that um, will happen as you see more and more uveitic patients. And then there, another way of kind of talking about classification or really describing the inflammation is the type of inflammation that you have. So there's this thing about granulomatous and non-granulomatous uveitis. So that's, this is another way of classifying it. And in granulomatous uveitis, when you look at the cornea, you have these large molten fat keratin precipitates in the back of the eye, um, which make you um, think about it being granulomatous. And you can see kind of exudation or veils in the vitreous um, and might even see kind of nodular lesions. Whereas in non granulomatous you don't tend to see the molten fat uh, KPs uh, per se, and the opacities in the vitreous tend to be quite mild. Um, and again, that's important because certain conditions like TB, sarcoid, Lyme disease will cause 
granulomatous uveitis and um, some other conditions um, will that that, that cause non granulomatous look different, like Fuchs heterochromic heterochromic iridocyclitis. Um, systemic features. So another way, you know, other things to kind of think about with type of inflammation is think about your systemic features. So, and this is kind of working backwards. So, you will know that, for example, patients with sarcoid will have skin involvement and respiratory condition. Patients with Bechet's will have mouth ulcers, genital ulcers, neurological symptoms, skin manifestations, TB, you know, all, so, that, so it's kind of looking through your various um, systemic uh, conditions and thinking how that relates to uveitis. Um, we've all kind of seen this grading over here about how many cells there are in the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So that's another way of classifying your inflammation. And then kind of talking about the onset of the disease, duration, is it acute, is it recurrent, is it chronic? And these are all kind of various ways of you describing the inflammation. So um, when you see a patient with inflammation, obviously you're gonna take a history. And what a lot of these textbooks trying to tell you is that there's, there's a thing called meshing, which is essentially involves as much as you can in a, in a sentence to try and describe the uveitis. For example, you will say 43 year old Afro-Caribbean man who has had three months history of anterior uveitis and blurred vision on examination has granulomatous uveitis. Uh, there is vasculitis, macular edema. He has breathing difficulties. Therefore, I think I'm thinking about sarcoid and TB as my differentials. That's the kind of way they want you to think about uveitis when, when you're doing it. And it's about pattern recognition and thinking what goes with what. So what I've described here really is just various three different ways of classifying what you're looking at and trying to think about a sensible differential diagnosis. And we come to this pattern recognition, which is you look at your patient demographics, you look at where the inflammation is occurring, you think about duration, onset, and course of the inflammation. For example, some inflammation can occur very rapidly. So post-operative inflammation, if untreated, will come very rapidly. Endophthalmitis will come very rapidly. And then some other conditions will build up over months and months and months. We just floaters slowly building up, causing problems such as TB, uh, such as sarcoid. Again, acute retinal necrosis comes on very quickly. So that, that onset helps you differentiate between the, the various things. And then um, characteristics of your inflammation. So where the inflammatory cells are, what do they look like? For example, macular edema is seen quite commonly with inflammatory uh, conditions causing uveitis. Infective cause of uveitis often don't cause macular edema. Um, so that's, that's an important differential to have because you know, if you've got somebody who comes in with slowly progressive inflammation in both eyes, um, you know, with macular edema, you're thinking almost certainly this is an inflammatory cause of uveitis. You're thinking about your uh, kind of your systemic conditions, like your, we come to this again and again, sarcoid, your MS, you know, things like that, or you're thinking, could this be actually um, a condition that purely affects in the eye? There's no systemic involvement, like VKH, like Berchot, Korea retinopathy, like serpiginous. So these are, these are kind of the kind of things that um, makes you think as, as you go along. And then etiology of the inflammation. And that is um, basically going through your differential diagnosis. So I'm just making sure that nobody is that's fine, saying things. So um, now pattern recognition. Um, so we've said that most, so, so these are kind of things that, for example, will help you uh, with your differential. So anterior segment uveitis, uh, most of the time is sterile and idiopathic. And about half of the case of anterior segment uveitis, uh, anterior uveitis are linked to HLA-B27. Um, intermediate uveitis, which is the inflammation affecting the vitreous, the peripheral retina and pars planar, um, are responsible for about 15 out of every 100 cases of uveitis and often is associated with granulomatous conditions such as TB and sarcoid. Floaters are very important. So a white eye with floaters 
you need to think about uh, uveitis as your differentials. Um, and I've mentioned the various systemic conditions you need to think about. Um, posterior uveitis is one of the commonest cause of blindness if untreated. And, you, and generally, when people talk about posterior uveitis, so remember, we had anterior intermediate posterior pan. So posterior uveitis is your uveitis that affects the disc, the, ret peripheral, the, the central retina, your blood vessels. Often when people see posterior uveitis, they talk about infectious and non-infectious uveitis. And that's a very important differential because it, it does affect your um, treatment strategy and your investigations. Um, and and, that, and, as, and as we'll come to it, you'll begin to understand that actually sometimes you don't have time to think how you, what you're going to treat or how you're going to treat. You just have to get on with the treatment. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. And as I mentioned to you, macular edema is unusual infected cases. So these are kind of all little pearls that you pick up as you see more and more uveitis to kind of help you differentiate what pattern you're looking at. So what can you do when the patient comes to you? Well, history. So this is one of the most important bits uh, when it comes to uh, inflammatory eye disease. History is very important. and We can do that when they see you in clinic. Um, that starts off with looking at how old the patient is. So if you're dealing with a child, you're thinking of juvenile um, JIA, I don't know what it stands for, idiopathic anterior UVI, arthritis, sorry, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Often patients with JIA have white looking eyes and cells. Um, and in fact, we often get sent patients with JIA for screening to see if they've got uh, the pressure is okay, cataract formation, how much cells they have, do they need treatment or not. Retinoblastoma, you know, absent red reflex, um, toxocariosis, if they've got, you know, pet special cat at home. So those are kind of the things that tend to affect children. Fuchs, um, heterochromic iridocyclitis, MS, Beschitz, um, AMPI, these kind of conditions tend to happen in young adults. AMPI is a condition that's often um, affecting the macular area and occurs after a viral prodrome. And patients present with gradual blurring of vision is self-limiting, but is associated with cerebral vasculitis. So these kind of conditions tend to happen in kind of your younger type adults. The middle-aged patients tend to present with bare shot, VKH, angst bond, reactive arthritis, and TB or, or syphilis can happen at any age, probably not children, but you know, so, 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 so the kind of age should, would already make you think what kind of condition you might be dealing with and uh, where this is going. With uh, male versus female, well, we know that angst bond, Beschitz, um, in particular, and reactive arthritis tends to be a lot commoner in males. Reactive arthritis tends to happen in patients following an infection such as gonorrhea or chlamydia. Um, and uveitis associated with GIA tends to occur more in females. So again, that's important when you're thinking about your patient. Race is very important. So for example, sarcoidosis tends to happen in that. This doesn't mean it doesn't happen in other, uh, other groups, but it's just more, much more likely. So sarcoidosis happens uh, more in Afro-Caribbean patients. HLA-B27 associated arthritis, such as angst bonds or arthritis, tends to happen in Caucasians. VKH, uh, Vogt, uh, I can't remember what the case is, Harada disease. Uh, so VKH tends to happen in uh, those of Asian uh, population. Um, and Beschitz um, tends to happen in the Silk Road, which is between China, Turkey, Iran, etc. cetera. Um, but most UVT conditions don't really have a, a sexual racial prediction. So another very important thing, which is often quite uncomfortable when you're seeing patients, that you need to take a detailed sexual history. And that's very important because you need to think about uh, sexually transmitted diseases causing infections, in particular syphilis um, and herpetic disease. Uh, CMV retinitis and a uh, lot of opportunistic infections that cause inflammatory disease happen in patients who are severely immunosuppressed. And they might just have HIV but not have immunosuppression per se, but they are still at risk of getting some of these conditions. So uh, you need to ask, um, and, if, and, and when you've got somebody in there with the parents, 
uh, who you might think is sexually active, you have to actually um, uh, ask the questions of whether you know they're with a partner, the stable partner. I often ask them, "Are you with a stable partner? Are you, uh, you know, currently sexually active?" So we had a chap who had uh, a disc, a swollen disc, and a macular star. So you know, um, we had to ask him whether, and he he hadn't been with anyone for twelve months. So that kind of made the STD side of things a bit, you know, you know, unlikely. And then whilst you're on that, you ask about use of IV drugs recreational drugs, et cetera, to just see. Um, patients who have syphilis, often, um, a lot of them test positive for HIV as well. So there is that association as well. And often if you think that's going on, you refer them to the um, you know, STD clinic. Geographic history, um, that's important. So the commonest thing that often everybody gets excited about is histoplasmosis, which is meant to go with the Mississippi, Ohio, Missouri river valleys in Southwest United States. Another one is the West Nile disease, which is a viral infection. Uh, so that's important. Lyme disease. So if you've been to the New Forest and been, uh, you know, bitten by a tick, that would make you think that somebody might, might have that. And these are important because some of these conditions might present with the eye, but have really devastating systemic conditions. For example, Lyme disease can give cardio, uh, cardiomyopathy and, uh, and myocarditis. It's important to diagnose this early because, you know, forgetting the fact that they might go blind and you might prevent a systemic condition that might follow. And family history of UVI is obviously important. So these are kind of just basic things, age, you know, sex, race, sexual habits, geographic history, family history that you need to kind of take and is important in your trying to establish why the inflammatory eye disease. Social habits, so uh, with toxo, for example, you think about ingestion of raw or undercooked meat, um, contact with cat feces, we think of toxoplasma. And then exposure to contagious disease. So we've mentioned already the um, STDs, IV drug use, um, and then you think about if there's been any foreign travel, anyone ill in the family, in particular TB, and having been to kind of um, some of the Asian Asian countries, I've mentioned the West Nile virus in Africa. Uh, recently, there was a lot of excitement about the Zika virus uh, from Brazil, and you know the others, malaria, typhoid. So. Travel history is quite important. So, so have you been away recently? Where have you been? Have you had the right immunizations and et cetera? Um, and then what do they do for a living? So for example, brucellosis is often seen in you know, livestock workers or slaughterhouse workers. And that again is another thing that you should be thinking about leptospirosis in miners or soil workers. So ask them what they do for a living. Um, uh, and where they've been in order to get as much information as possible. So that's kind of your patient demographics, which will, again, uh, point you to a certain direction. There's no fast and easy way about learning inflammation. It's just learning with time how you recognize patterns and how you think certain things will follow. And by and large, you know, infections and things like that are often quite unusual. You know, if somebody's been somewhere really exciting, um, and unusual, everybody scratches their head and they often go around various tertiary centers and nobody knows what's going on. But, but you know, most of uveitic conditions which are systemic or related to the eye are often quite easily diagnosed once you know what patterns you're looking for. Symptoms and signs, so when they come to your practice, everybody kind of, when you tell them iritis, thinks photophobia and redness as chief complaints, and that's, that's true, but pain, is not always there. So for example, as I mentioned to patients with uh, juvenile um, idiopathic arthritis or Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis come with white eyes. In fact, with, with Fuchs, you know, that's one of the things to differentiate it with uveitis is the eye or red. So you don't always have to have redness and pain with inflammation. That's very important to understand that because kids with JIA uh, won't have either of those. And that's why they come us to screen them to make sure they haven't got inflammation in the eyes. Blurring of vision is very important sign um, in, or symptom, I should say, in patients with uveitis, and it can occur due to a variety of reasons. So it can be there 
because the pressure has gone up, so the cornea becomes odomatous, because you've got cystoid macular edema, because you might the pressure might actually be low. You might have hypotony because of irido, you know, because of your um, ciliary body shut down, and you start getting macular macular folds and hypotony. Floaters, as I mentioned, can cause blurring of vision, and often this can happen with dense vitritis. So um, a lot of patients with intermediate uveitis. Um, or even posterior segment uh, uveitis, if they've got fluid vitritis, they will have blurred vision or lots of floaters, and yet their eye is white. So, you know, just because there is no anterior segment changes, it doesn't mean nothing's going on in the back of the eye. And that's why it's very important to look at the back of the eye to look for all these things. And when the choroid and retina is involved, then often um, that's quite obvious, and that's why people have uh, problems or optic nerve involvement. So blurred vision, those are the various things that can do it. I mentioned about floaters. Um, and just if you think about any tissue that has a vascular supply is capable of inflammation because that's where the inflammatory cells come from. So if you think about your lid right back to your optic nerve, any tissue can have signs of inflammation. Um, now, most of the time, however, in the kind of typical uveitis that would present to your practice, you would have the redness and the circumlimbal ciliary flush and anterior chambers and flare. That's kind of the most common symptom that patients see. So you do have to kind of switch the light off. Um, you know, imagine how you see kind of, a, you know, those little things when you're in the cinema as the projector is going across the, um, you know, um, the cinema room. Uh, you need to kind of make the light really thin and just look for cells. So what I often do is to get the iris really clear in my view and just pull back a little bit. So then I'm looking in the anterior chamber one by one millimeter um, square in order to kind of look for Im inflammatory cells. And you look for flare and essentially these cells are just white cells. You've got, when you've got anterior chamber activity, these are white cells that are present um, in uveitis. And, um, you know, these symptoms and presence of cells, whether in the anterior chamber or in the vitreous, are quite important because they help us indicate whether the patient is improving or not. Posterior synechi and peripheral anterior synechi, you'll see some pictures in a minute, are other symptoms of chronic ongoing inflammation. And they can, of course, cause problems with trabecular meshwork and pressure and pupillary block and all sorts of things. So if you've got complete zipping of the um, pupil, then you can get iris bombay and the you know, pressure can go up and that can cause all sorts of uh, issues. And I've kind of mentioned about snow banking and detritus. So here's just some pictures. As I said, today's lecture isn't really about looking at various inflammatory conditions. I will do that if there's enough of you who want me to, going through various inflammatory conditions. I just wanted to go through how you would basically assess a patient with uveitis, if you like. So you've got loads of endothelial uh, KPs in this picture over here. You could argue that they are mutton fat KPs, so this would be granulomatous uveitis. Here's a picture of a patient with loads of anterior, um, UV, you know, anterior chamber cells. You've got this white residue right at the bottom, so that's hypopian. This is when you've got so many white cells that they start kind of uh, collecting at the bottom of the iris. And then a very poor picture of the fl of flare. You know, you kind of need to see it in real life to, to, to appreciate it. Um, posterior synechia, looking like a heart. Um, and another picture here. So here you can still see that there is some space. So you haven't got complete zipping uh, and certainly no Bombay. Gonioscopy here is showing that the iris stuck to the uh, trabecular meshwork. So that's your PAS um, um, with the angles zipping up. And that, that can be kind of quite a dangerous situation to end up with. That's peripheral, peripheral anterior synechi. Um, most of the time with uveitis, and we come to treatment in a minute, we do treat patients with cycloplegics in order to avoid getting posterior, uh, posterior kind of synechi formation. And that can make life difficult, particularly if you are uh, doing cataract surgery um, or you're kind of trying to deal with pressure. 
And actually, we don't use atropine. We don't want to use atropine because that will paralyze the iris uh, for far too long. And we've moved on to cyclopentolate now as a way of dilating. And some people say we should even use a lower, ac uh, lower acting agent like tropicamide so that you dilate the pupil, but you still allow it some sort of mobility so that it doesn't get stuck in one place. Um, these are kind of signs that I can mention when we discuss part two lecture. So that's what I was telling you about snow banking. So you can see a bank of white in the kind of past planar area here, another snow banking thing uh, that you can see here. And you, you can see these kind of mothballs, uh, which is kind of the snowballing that you can see in the anterior vitreous uh, in patients with intermediate uveitis, often associated with TB, sarcoid, Lyme disease, and conditions like that. Um, more clinical pictures. So these are your mutton fat KPs. This looks very different to what you see in Fuchs, heterochromic erythrocytosis, which are equally, you know, equal kind of KPs throughout the cornea. Whereas with mutton fat KPs, you tend to see quite lumpy KPs all gravitating towards the bottom of the cornea. Looking at the back of the eye, this is why I'm saying that you should definitely um, dilate to see what's happening at the back. You can see very clear uh, vasculitis at the back. And with vasculitis, again, it's important to see, is it affecting the arteries? Is it affecting the venous system? Or is it affecting both? And that can help you diagnose what kind of condition you're dealing with. For example, you know, lupus tends to affect the arterial side, sarcoid tends to affect the venous side. It's not pathognomonic, but it certainly does try and help with uh, differentiating uh, your condition. And uh, an example of looking at anterior chamber cells. So more pictures of patients with posterior segment uh, disorders. So this patient with very florid chorioretinitis. This is a patient with serpiginous over here. You've got a patient with established sarcoid affecting the retina and the choroid. Um, you see pigmentary change at the RPE level when the condition is chronic and progressive. And this is another patient with huge pigmentation in the back of the eye. And another, uh, and this patient also has serpiginous. So investigations. Well, often your investigations um, are targeted around what conditions you're thinking about. And that's when your patient demographics comes in. That's when your history taking comes in. That's where you've examined the patient and seen where it is, what kind of inflammatory cells you have. Is it the front? Is it the middle? Is it the whole thing? Um, you know, when you put it all together, you in your brain start thinking about what it could be due to. Is it essentially infected? Is it inflammatory? Is it secondary to some sort of cancerous condition? Um, you know, and that will help you differentiate. But in a clinical, in a, in a kind of a office setting, Amsler grid can be quite useful because that can tell you whether the macula is involved. So macular edema will give you distortion and that can help. Fluorescein angiography, obviously you don't do in an office setting, but we do that quite a bit. Um, and it's interesting actually, because sometimes you don't see any vasculitis, papillitis or anything like that. But when you do an angiogram, you can see subclinical vasculitis. And what that means is that Normally, there should be no staining of your blood vessels. But when you do an angiogram, you see staining all over the place. So you know that the condition is occurring, but it's just not significant enough to be seen with a naked eye. Um, and, um, you know, one of the other things we look at is, for example, the optic nerve. Is the disc hot? Is, it, is there any leakage of the disc? And again, that tells you whether there is inflammation occurring at the optic nerve level. So fluorescein angiography for uveitis actually is one of those really important things and something that OCTA has certainly not been able to help with. Um, and now we've got white field angiography so you can see all the way in the periphery to see whether there are things happening in the periphery. Um, sometimes you might need to do uh, more things. I've kind of jumped a little bit. So let's see what you could do in clinic. Visual field is very important. Um, certain conditions which look as if the macula kind of looks okay or optic nerve looks okay but then you do the visual field test and the visual field test looks awful so actually visual fields and amsler are two things um, that i would definitely 
do in a patient with you guys if you can um, in a primary care setting. Um, sometimes we have to uh, go and remove a bit of aqueous and that can be done in order to look for an infection in particular so we uh, send it off for PCR and look for viral um, DNA to see if we can find something. Um, co color vision, um, so again in an office setting, AMSLA grid, visual fields, color vision is very important because that will tell you about your optic nerve. So um, again, the color vision would be affected out of proportion if the optic nerve is affected in these patients and contrast sensitivity. And OCT, most practices have now have OCT. So knowing whether there is macroedema or not would help. As I mentioned to you, inflammatory uh, conditions causing uveitis tend to cause macroedema a lot more than any infective. So that, that would be, that's a nice investigation to do. We would sometimes do a B scan to check for posterior sclerosis. So that's the T sign, retro detachment or, or vitritis, especially if the fundus is really badly affected and you can't see the back of the eye, then that can be quite a useful thing to, a useful function to do. So um, moving on to investigations, there are certain investigations that you always do, for example, your full blood count, renal function, LFD. So some of these, the function test, sorry. Some of these investigations are important because you need a baseline before you start patients on heavy duty immunosuppressants. And then, you know, your typical inflammatory markers, ESR, CRP. Um, you may want to look at immune testing. So ANA often is a good marker uh, to see if there's anything wrong. And if ANA comes back as positive, then you can look at other things like double-stranded DNA for SLE or anchor for Wegener's granulomatosis or pan polyarthritis nodosa. Uh, rheumatoid factor, uh, often in some of the musculoskeletal conditions, rheumatoid arthritis and other conditions. Serum ACE in sarcoid. Okay, so these are kind of your typical immune testing that one would do in a patient in order to see what's going on. And then if you're worried about infection, um, or if, even if it's not clear, some of these are very important to exclude. So VDRL, which is syphilis, syphilis can cause anything. So actually, if you're in an exam situation, somebody shows you a patient, you're not sure what's going on, just say syphilis and you'll get a point. So um, TB, toxo, so TB, you'd have a history hopefully, but it might be that, you know, they don't necessarily have the cough and the chest problems, it might just be in the eye. So the commonest manifestation of TB in the eye is a single choroidal granuloma. And that can vary to miliary TB where you get the uh, peripheral uh, retinal changes and the vitritis and the uh, retinitis type uh, picture or, or Eels disease, which is kind of a subset of, of condition where you get kind of peripheral retinal vasculitis and new vessel formation and vitreous hemorrhage. So TB again can cause quite a lot of things. Granulomatous antibiotics, and I think it does. Toxo is probably something you've all seen, um, you know, with a retinitis, retinitis and vitritis and vasculitis, uh, etc. So I would do an infection screen. If you're going to do an HIV, um, I would probably make, well, you'd need to make sure that the patient is consented uh, and they know that you're going to do that. HLA B27 is quite useful with your immune testing. So those are kind of my usual uh, platform of bloods that I do in somebody who has got um, anterior segment and posterior segment uveitis. I must say, I don't investigate pure anterior uveitis if it's occurred once. If they get recurrent, then you need to be looking at them, uh, especially HLA B27. And then you go on to imaging. So chest x-ray, we organize. That might give you a clue with sarcoid TB. MRI is important. Um, you might diagnose MS and neurosarcoid. People don't know this, but actually MS does present with choroiditis and choroidal lesions. And sometimes it can be very difficult to, do, to differentiate MS from neurosarcoid, especially if there is no vitritis, retinitis, or vasculitis. MS doesn't cause those, but uh, you know, if it's purely affecting the choroid, those two conditions can be quite difficult to differentiate. And I've already mentioned ultrasound discount. So, so neuroimaging uh, is important and not, I'd say, 
the first thing you do, you probably do other things. And when, if you start thinking that something systemic is going on, then you might want to consider doing that. And then we've said biopsy. So conjunctival lesions are normally quite easy to access and lovely to biopsy because they can give you a condition unlike retinal, choroidal, you know, iris lesions, which are a lot more difficult to biopsy. Uh, we've often done a lot of vicious and AC tap, obviously in patients with endophthalmitis. So if you've got somebody who's got retinitis and you're worried they might have acute retinal necrosis, uh, then I would probably just do an AC tap now. You probably don't need to do a vit vitreous tap as you can pull on the vitreous and cause retinal detachment. But if you think that there is an infection going on, um, which might be fungal or something that doesn't look quite right, then you might need a vitreous sample. Diagnostic vitrectomy, so at this point, you, you'd be sending them off to a, kind of your local VR surgeon, and these would be conditions where you can't actually see the back of the eye. So patient comes in with a red eye, anterior uveitis, vitreitis, you've got no idea what's going on because you can't see the back of the eye. You don't know what you're treating. You can't establish a pattern. And in that circumstance, then you might send them off to VR for them to just clear the crud from the vitreous and see what's going on. So coming on to the point of whether you need to uh, treat or not, uh, and whether you have time to treat. So really what it comes down to is whether you can recognize a pattern. And what I often do, so this is a kind of questions that I go through my head when I see a patient with kind of um, cyst, you know, anterior and posterior uveitis, is can I see a pattern? Is this something that is just systemic? So is this part, does it look as if it's part of it? Do they have other, other issues? In particular, I do a very detailed systemic history. Have you been diagnosed with any medical conditions? Are you on any tablets? Often they won't tell you. You know, they're like on long time prednisolone and they won't tell you that they've been diagnosed with SLE 20 years ago. So asking them the drug history would often help. Um, and, you know, other things like, have you, have you been away? Is it, has, has there been any, uh, kind of recent contact with somebody who's ill? Um, have you had ever had any cancer? Again, another thing, unfortunately, that sometimes happens is that they'll come with a mass in the eye or, you know, it would masquerade some sort of, um, uveitis, but then you find out that five years ago, they were given clear after the breast cancer, um, treatment. And then you think, you know, gosh, could this be something else? Or for example, you know, lymphoma is another great masquerader, which you think comes with vitritis. And it's only when you do the vitreous biopsy that you see something's going on. So you ask about any kind of B symptoms like weight loss, sweating, things like that. So can you see it? So pattern recognition, that will come with experience and time. You need to sit in a few uveitis clinics to pick these kind of things up. So that, so that, will often hopefully come out as you're taking the history, looking at patient demographics, asking all those questions we've been through to see if you can see a pattern. And then um, the second thing I look at is, am I going to put this patient at risk if I don't treat straight away? Do I have time to wait for the investigations to come back? Some investigations you'll get back in a day or two, some can take weeks. So often, if there is optic nerve involvement or there's significant macular involvement, then you have to make a decision and treat and take the chance. And I'll come to kind of how, how you do that in a minute. Um, what's the current level of vision? If the vision is good and it's likely that whatever, you know, that the inflammation is not going to immediately cause irreversible loss of vision, then often I wait for the investigation to come back and target therapy that way. But um, as I said, if I think that the condition is such that I'm going to lose the patient, lose the vision, or you know I'm going to miss something, then often I would probably treat. And you can involve physicians with this if you're worried that something systemic might be going on. Often, um, what we do, of course, when somebody has inflammation, is use high dose steroids. And you've got, say, your anterior uveitis patient, you start obviously with topical steroids. Even if there's macular edema, and you can get macular edema pure with anterior uveitis, people don't realize that. They kind of think, oh, it's all anterior 
it's not going to go to the back. But actually, it's very important patients with anterior uveitis to check if the macula, if there's macular edema. And often the macular edema responds to high dose of topical steroids. No point in giving them Maxidex QDS. That's not going to do anything. You need to be on the Maxidex hourly if there's macular edema. And um, that's kind of your anterior uveitis type picture. But if you've got somebody who's got macular edema, vitritis, anterior uveitis, vasculitis, then I'm thinking, well, is this infective or is it inflammatory? Because if it's infective, then steroids could make them worse. Um, so I think, have they been anyway? Have they been anywhere? What's the sexual history like? Um, have they been in touch with anybody who is ill? Do they have, do they eat raw meat? Do they have pets? You know, all those kind of things. And if there's no obvious infection going on, then I would start them on one milligram per kilogram steroid if the macular or the optic nerve is threatened because I need to stop that getting worse. Um, or, or, or is this some sort of ocular syndrome like Birchot's chorea retinopathy or something like that, which again, steroids will help. Bechet's disease, which again, steroids will help. Um, and, I, and what I will do is my strategy often is, can I get away with topical? If not, then you think local. Now, Soptinos or Ozodex is probably saved if it's only one eye, obviously. If, there is, if it's in both eyes, then you're really thinking oral pernicillin. If it's purely in one eye, then I'm thinking Soptinos or Ozodex. But be very careful with local administration because once you put Ozodex in or Soptinos, you can't then take it out. So you need to make sure if you're going to do, you're pretty sure what the diagnosis is. Um, and, and to be honest, most of the time, I'm either using topical or systemic, because the nice thing with systemic steroids is you can just stop it, um, if, you, if, if things are going bad in the first two weeks. If it's more than two weeks, you need to taper it down. And then if I'm really worried that there might be a bit of infection going on, or this is not a clear non-infective, uh, sorry, this is not a clear, um, um, not, yeah, this is not a clear inflammatory thing. There might be an infective element to this, then I would start thinking what I would cover it with. And azithromycin seems to be kind of a typical antibiotic to use. It tends to be effective against the kind of your parasitic infections like toxoplasmosis. Um, Valacyclovir um, tends to be kind of your uh, antiviral of choice if you're worried that there might be um, acute retinal necrosis going on or there might be a viral um, element. And then you might even think of an antifungal uh, treatment like ketoconazole. Now, th these are, this doesn't mean that every single patient that comes in with some sort of panuveritis, you have to start them on the whole thing. But if you think that I can't be 100% sure there is no infection and I don't have time to investigate, then you might start oral prednisolone with all these other agents to cover. Um, and then as investigations come back, you can slowly start taking one that. For example, let's say you've got a patient with retinitis, vasculitis, vitritis, and you think, well, you know, it could be in, in one eye, you think it could be toxo, but it could be kind of an inflammatory condition that uh, is not related to toxins, you know, just unilateral um, inflammatory condition with, within the eye. You would start them on, say, oral penicillin, but cover them up with azithromycin or clindamycin um, uh, as, another, as another agent. And then as you do your kind of investigations, such as your toxo IgM, IgG, if that comes back negative, then you can stop the azithromycin and then think what else might be going on. So, you know, you often play around with various things. And sometimes, as I mentioned, there is no view. So what you might actually have to do is to do a diagnostic vitrectomy. So what they do is they just remove all the crud from the vitreous and inject the patient with um, antibiotics. So sometimes they use Kef or vancomycin. They can use Foscarnet. Um, in order to um, cover the patient for um, an antiviral um, etiology as well, and then wait for the investigations to come back and see where they go. So these are the kind of patients that I was telling you about. So you've got this patient over here who's got this massive retinitis affecting the macula. This patient cannot wait until you've had your investigations back. This is another patient where you've got kind of 
areas of retinitis in the periphery are coming in. So this patient has acute retinal necrosis with, and you can see with a lot of these pictures, if the picture is not clear, it's because they have uh, vitritis and anterior uveitis. That's why you can't get a very clear picture of the back of the eye. And um, that, again, is a patient where you need to start therapy before your investigation results come back. That patient has primary, primary toxoplasmosis. Again, you, know, you need to start treatment before. And then in this one, a clearer picture, although I've obviously nicked it from internet, but this was a very clear picture. So this patient has CMV retinitis. So you've got hemorrhages and retinitis all over. And the reason this is a clear image is because patients with CMV retinitis often get it because they have zero immunity and there's hardly any inflammation, there's hardly any vitritis or anterior uveitis, which is why you can take a good picture of the back of the eye. And again, treatment for that would be different. So you would, uh, you know, we, we used to give them intravenous uh, a, uh, antiviral agents, but now you, oral agents are, are quite good as well. Obviously, when it's something like that, then you need to involve the medics and admit the patient in because obviously the eye is at great risk. Um, but then some other conditions you may have time. So over here I've included a picture of a patient again with retinitis but it's away from the disc, from the macula. This turns out to be a, a toxoplasmosis uh, which is not going to be immediately threatening you. And then you've got other conditions like this where you've got hemorrhages there, vasculitis. So this patient has a sarcoid there is actually um, a limited um, hemiretinal vein occlusion here. So there's a vascular event that's occurred. So this patient probably needs steroid treatment, but you don't need to rush with it. You can wait for the investigations to come back. Um, and then the other things that I think about is obviously a plan for the future. So if I think that a patient may have a systemic condition like Bechet, sarcoid, MS, syphilis, I'll refer them to the specialist because obviously there are other organs that are going to be involved. And really, in, you know, a lot of these patients, you need to think that it's a multi-system uh, condition. Um, and, you know, I think if you're running a, a uveitis clinic, I mean, what we do where we are is certainly start them off, investigate them, if there's somebody where they need second line agent, we do refer them on to tertiary center. I don't try and keep hold of these patients because what you really need in order to manage these patients are you know, a good network with your rheumatologist um, or somebody like that or immunologist because you know, you're gonna start them on very toxic medication and you need to know what you're doing with these patients. So often having a rheumatologist is very useful because they know about the biologics um, so, you know, you're starting patients on interferon and things like that, you could potentially kill them if you're not careful what you're doing. So, um, I, well, certainly at ESH, we tend to try and diagnose them. And then if we think that the condition requires um, prolonged, lifelong immunosuppression, then we pass them on. And the, re the reason for that is because you can't stay on oral prednisolone forever. So, any one in general who requires to have oral prednisolone more than 10 milligrams once a day will need to go on a second line agent as a steroid sparing agent. So oral prednisolone generally is very good for controlling the problem, but it's not good long term because of all the massive side effects that you get with oral steroids. So if you can't control them on less than 10 milligrams, then you need to think of second line agents such as azathioprine, Celsep, uh, you know, um, more kind of cyclophosphamide. These are kind of like the really third line, third line agents, which are, which are really toxic. And then if you've got problems with that, then maybe biologics. So um, interferon and you know other stuff that they use for Bechet's and MS, kind of you know will will be utilised based on local protocols, etc. But that really does need kind of a specialist clinic. Uh, with rheumatology involvement and other multidisciplinary people to look after the patient as a whole. Um, and, um, you know, I would involve them in patient support groups. So, you know, we had a young girl who came to me nine years ago when I first started here, actually, 
um, and she ended up having Bechet's disease. And nine years on, I'm still looking after her um, with, you know, in collaboration with Brighton. So I've given her Ozodex implants in order to control inflammation. She's now on biologic treatment and you can just see slowly, sadly, vision going down. I mean, you know, she started off with six, nine vision in both eyes and she's, I think, 28, 29 now has lost vision in one eye and the other one, she's 618. They get cataract and, you know, you will always, always have these patients in your clinic and unfortunately they flare up and just get a little bit worse. So it is, it is quite a tough crowd uh, to manage, but you really do need involvement of everybody in order to manage them so we do we do kind of share management with the tertiary center but often initiation of the second line is with them as they've got the right medical support before they come back to us i just wanted to touch a little bit on covid and uveitis because obviously um as you know covid is a massive problem for all and in uveitis patients is particularly a big issue because patients with uveitis uh, are often on systemic immunosuppression, which makes them susceptible to disease. And also because patients with uveitis often have quite frequent visits to the hospital. So, uh, you know, these are kind of important things to, um, uh, well, it's an important group to think about. So with uveitis and COVID, what we do is we've tried to manage them as virtually as we can. However, unfortunately, with the new cases, we still want to see them face to face because it's time critical. I, I mean, this probably doesn't apply now because at the moment we're seeing routine cases, but I'm saying this was at the height of the pandemic and should we go to, God forbid, another lockdown where we go back down to pure emergencies, which is hopefully unlikely. These are the kind of things that one might think about. We obviously have PPE and other checks like clinic visits, um, any elective surgeries deferred like cataract surgery, but people continued with urgent care. And um, really active non-infectious uveitis, not responding to topical treatment alone may require a peripheral steroid. So I was aware of patients who would have probably gone on systemic immunosuppression like, you know, high dose or prednisolone who ended up having <clears throat> um, Kenalog, you know, uh, in, on the orbital floor or um, intravitreal tramcillinone to control their inflammation. These were known diagnoses, obviously not infectious, um, rather than systemic immunosuppression. And also, you know, just trying to see whether you could make the uh, steroid treatment more regional rather than um, anything else. And this is like Beshets, um, you know, whether they, they, instead of coming to the hospital visits, they could stuff and minister uh, or stuff like that and uh, screening for COVID, of course, if you were going to start them on immunosuppression. So I know it was causing a lot of headache with a lot of things, with a lot of patients. Um, gosh, I've gone really over. M involving multidisciplinary team, uh, et cetera, um, and following World Health Organization guidelines in, in management of these patients. Luckily, we, this group of patients are often based towards Brighton, but certainly we were getting the new ones coming in and trying to manage them. So finally, um, your eight steps for managing uveitis patients. In my views, review your symptoms, look at signs, review the history and uh, systems, perform clinical examination, classify uveitis, look at what you need for your bloods and radiological investigations, aggressive treatment, it's very important to get this. If you've got inflammation, you really have to get on top of it. No point in mucking around with using max six three times a day. If you've got inflammation, you need to get on top of it. And of course, appropriate referral. Thank you very much. Hi, Shana. Thank you very much for that. That was an excellent webinar. Sorry, I went 15 minutes over. I just realized. That's all right. No, that's okay. But no, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, if you could. Let me know as soon as possible when you want to do the second part of that, and I will apply for CET and get that arranged. But yeah, I mean, I think this is just trying to get um, an approach to uveitis. It's, go it's not going to be possible to teach uveitis on yeah. webinars because, unlike other conditions, mm -hmm. it really is about recognizing patterns and just having experience with it. But it does help what you could do in a primary care setting 
you know, the kind of questions you need to ask and, and not forget. And I hope that kind of was at least useful with that regard. Yeah, it was an excellent talk and I've learned so much from just this 45, 50 minutes that you've spoken to us. I think it was excellent. So I'm definitely looking forward to part two. So you must okay. let me know when I can arrange yeah. that on Saturday for that. Okay. I've got a couple of questions for you that have been sent in. Oh, I think there's another question as well. Uh, but the first question is, uh, you may have touched on it briefly, but if you could maybe just remind us again or tell us the best way. Um, what's the best way to see cells and flare on the slit lamp? I so I think what I would do is um, switch the light off in the room and turn the brightness right up as much as it goes, narrow the beam, and I would kind of make it one by one millimeter, so make it quite small, maybe a little bit bigger than that. And then look at look through the slit lamp. Uh, so I, I wouldn't have them together, I'll have them like at maybe 45 degrees. Look at the iris, get the iris in real sharp focus, and then just come back ever so little bit. So then you're looking at the anterior chamber and look for cells. Cells that are near the iris would be traveling up. Cells that are nearly would go down, and that's the trend. Is it the trend Dellenberg effect on it? Because iris is hot because you've got blood vessels there, so because of convection, the cells that are near iris kind of tend to travel up, and then as they get towards the cornea, they tend to go down. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much for that. And for vitritis, um, to look at vitritis, what I tend to do again, exactly the same, but just go further back behind the lens, and you might be able to see them. Or the other thing you do is to have them kind of cracks your, you know, together, the microscope and the light. And then if you just look at the red reflex, get them to look up and down, and then you can see cells like that mm -hmm. um, as you're looking at the jelly. And that's how you kind of pick up vitritis there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shah. Um, are there any particular causes of uveitis that present late in age, i.e. around 70 to 80 years of age? Um, so most of the things that we see, uh, I mean, you know, children, again, is unusual, tends to be in middle age uh, and slightly kind of older. I, uh, I won't I say who's asked that question, but so 70 to 80 for you to start getting uh, kind of uveitis is quite unusual. I mean, most of the time, if you think, inflammatory conditions, that involve pan or posterior uveitis, things like that, tend to be either pure ocular conditions like VKH, sarcoid, you know, Bechet's, you know, those kind of conditions, um, or, you know, Bershot chorioretopathy, things like that, which are kind of really middle aged. I suppose in an elderly patient, I'll think about infection. So, for example, shingles. Um, uh, then going to the back of the eye and causing retinal um, necrosis. Um, I think with the systemic conditions, they present a lot earlier. I mean, systemic, a lot of these inflammatory conditions occur when you're fairly young and your immune system is active and you mount a big immune, immune response, I think. I think when you get older, the whole immune system just depresses down. So I think these kind of pure inflammatory autoimmune type conditions tend to get less as they get older, but the infections don't. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the kind of the endophthalmitis, which we cause often, uh, I mean, another big thing which we didn't talk about is endogenous endophthalmitis. So these are kind of your patients with bacterial endocarditis or UTI getting a systemic infection and then getting endophthalmitis in the eye. So, so the infections can, uh, and often they're nasty and often you've lost the eye. So with inflammation, you often have a good chance of getting a lot of it back. You got good going bacterial endophthalmitis or good going infection in the eye in the older, older kind of generation, you, you, you've lost it. So I suppose, yeah, the infections. No, lovely, thank you very much. I think that's all, all the questions, but there's one statement I will read out uh, from my Zoom mentor. Um, absolutely brilliant lecture, please do another. I think you know who that is from. Yeah, she, I've, I've given her ten pounds to say that. So, <laughs> um, thank you. No, I think I think as I said, what what would what I'd like to do, if there is, well, you're going to get feedback, I I presume. Yeah, hopefully, yes. I'm going to ask. Yeah. You. So what I'd like to do is, uh, your wife's asking for you. 
uh, is I definitely yeah. like to I definitely like to um, concentrate the next one on various conditions that would present because I I felt this is kind of probably a little bit not boring but well yeah you know you just go through the approach rather than anything else which might be useful but we just talk about how various conditions would present how yeah. infections would present how infl inflammation would present and probably will take me some time to collect nice pictures and stuff like that so that would be part two for yeah. me to do maybe in january or december depending on what yeah. we have we've okay. had a, quite a few people because obviously we've got the social science group a lot of people from that are watching the webinar but we've had quite a few people from uh they've seen the the webinar advertised on the goc and docket website so if anybody's watching this that's not part of the ESO Society group that would like to see the second part, if you email me on the, uh, the email address that you applied for this website, then I will certainly add you onto that. Um, but um, I will um, try and upload the CET points early next week. I normally try and do it the day after, but it's gonna take, uh, I'm not gonna be able to do this weekend. So uh, hopefully Monday I'll get the CET loaded up. And the, the YouTube um, recording of this webinar Hopefully next, middle of next week, Wednesday, Thursday, I will aim to have that um, on the YouTube channel as well, ESO Society Group, if uh, you want to look. But I'd like to say once again, thank you very much, um, Charles. You're welcome. It's, um, it's an, been an excellent uh, webinar. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope everybody has. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and uh, for your time, and especially to you, Charles, for take the time to write this and to, to, to obviously give us the information and teach us uh, on this subject so thank, thank you Ian. let us know when it goes on youtube next week sometime thank you very I'll, much. i'll put on the uh, the whatsapp group when it's on on as well so thank you very much take care Bye. thank you very much all goodbye now thank you